right, now that you're watching this video, um, you might want to go to the description box of this video and click on those two links. Those two links will take you to two discussions that took place on a Facebook, private Facebook page called Pussyfooted KJV Discussions. And so if you have an opportunity, uh, upload those, upload those videos, links in a separate browser because when Doug gets a hold of this video, he's going to remember that those discussions took place and he'll probably go through and delete them. So it doesn't matter because I documented everything and I'm going to include all, this, all that documentation in this video. Nevertheless, though, if you want to follow along on the actual page itself, click on those two links and you can refer back to them to see what I'm talking about. So here you go. Enjoy the, enjoy the movie. Dobbs Ferry, New York is a village in the greater New York City area that lies right on the Hudson River. This village of 3.2 square miles is home to a population of 11,000 residents, including this man. Hey everyone on Facebook, my name is Doug Trowbridge. I just rode my bike about 20 or 30 miles from Dobbs Ferry, New York to uh, Croton, New York, and right now I'm at the uh, Cro Croton Quarry. Um, in a, 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 like I said, in this town called Croton on Hudson or, or Cortland Manor, one of those two towns. Uh, I'm not from around here, so I'm not too sure. But uh, it's a beautiful day, and I'm here to just do some cliff jumping. Um, here's what the quarry looks like. And as you can see, those cliffs are probably about 20 or 30 feet high, so this should be fun uh, jumping off. And uh, yeah, um, so let's let's give it a try. All right, have a, I hope you're having a wonderful day out there, and uh, God bless. Bye. Jeff here. This is my video response to the recent Doug Trowbridge controversy and my accusations that he is a psychopathic reprobate and he's capable of the worst forms of violence making him a very dangerous individual. This controversy started when on July 12, 2018, Pastor Romero of Steadfast Baptist Church located in Fort Worth, Texas posted a video to Facebook warning everyone of Doug Trowbridge who had recently been kicked out of his church for behaviors that, though not criminal, were very odd. Garrett Gates then posts a screenshot of a statement that I made about Doug back on April 15, 2014, where I'm warning everyone that Doug Trowbridge is a psychopath capable of murder. In Pastor Romero's video about Doug Trowbridge, he provides me with key information into the psychological makeup of Doug. So in response to this new revelation, I then upped the ante by making a series of more controversial statements about him on Facebook, where I carefully state that I believe that Doug could evolve into a child molesting serial killer by the time he entered his 30s. I finish it off by leaving a public message for Doug in which I say, Doug John Trowbridge keeps deleting my comments, so I'll leave it right here. If anyone disagrees and wants to get mad at me, I have no hard feelings toward you. And I will not argue with anyone about this except Doug himself. 
Quote, Doug, you're not fooling me the second time around. I saw your mask drop the first time, and I saw the real you. I observed you the second time around, and I caught on to your modus operandi. You are a psychopath playing the humble idiot that everyone feels bad for. But you have no conscience and are capable of the worst forms of violence. You're a sick reprobate, and unfortunately, I believe I'll be proven right in time. End quote. I would then receive a lot of blowback from Doug's friends for making this bold accusation against him. But I don't respond to their comments, because this accusation is not intended for their friend Doug Trowbridge. My words are actually an intended trap for another man that I will refer to as John Thone, a man that I haven't heard from in four years. Many people are fooled by Doug Trowbridge and think that he's this humble idiot with a low IQ, but that is just a mask. Doug Trowbridge is actually a very intelligent, calculated psychopath. But in order to understand this accusation, you have to know my history with Doug Trowbridge and something that I experienced with him. My history with Doug Trowbridge goes back to 2013 when I became Facebook friends with him in August of that year, just before the upcoming New York City Soul Winning Marathon. So immediately I noticed some concerns about Doug on Facebook and the first one was he didn't seem to have any hobbies or friendships outside of Facebook and in fact all his friends on Facebook were people he never met in person. And he seemed like he was trying to compete with everyone, trying to prove himself to be the most spiritual guy in the movement. And he became a real blowhard, offending people and just saying radical things for the sake of being radical. And he even was calling any pastor who was not associated with Pastor Anderson, he was calling him a reprobate. Just real over the top, a real blowhard. Then in September of 2013, I would meet Doug for the first time in person at the New York City Soul Winning Marathon. Now, while on the New York City Soul Winning Marathon, one of my friends who was Doug's soul winning partner pointed out to me that he did preach a thorough gospel and he led the person in prayer. So at this point in Doug's uh, timeline, he is very thorough with the gospel to the point where he can actually give the gospel to someone and lead them in prayer. So after the New York City Soul Winning Marathon, my friends and I would continue to stay in touch with Doug through text or phone call. And you know, some nights he would keep me on the phone for like an hour or two, and it was like really annoying and to, the, to the point where I had to just cut him off from doing that. But what was more disturbing is that he was not just doing this with me, he was doing this with like my friends and other people in the movement to the point where like, if you've tallied it up, he was on the phone for like eight or 10 hours a day talking to people, it was ridiculous. Then I began to notice he would leave these over flattering, over the top flattering remarks about us on Facebook saying like, oh, I just got off the phone with my friend Jeff for two hours. It's just, he's just the greatest Christian that I've ever met. He's such an inspiration. I'm so thankful to have Christian friends like him in my life. You know, just real over the top. And he was leaving those type of flattering remarks about everyone he was on the phone with. Then I began to notice that he would start to make these over the top claims that he was like in downtown New York City soul winning for like eight hours in sub degree temperatures and his hands were near, nearly frostbitten and he would say like you know he still managed to give the gospel to like 30 or 40 people and get like 30 or 40 like a, a ridiculous number of people saved to the point where like my friends and I were not buying it there was something off about him in, in this in this claim of his. Doug then makes public posts talking about how excited he is for his upcoming trip to Arizona to visit Pastor Anderson of Faithful Word Baptist Church. However, sometime before his trip, I get a call from Doug stating that Pastor Anderson informed him that he was not welcome to visit Faithful Word Baptist Church. When I asked Doug for the reason behind this, Doug stated that some girl was framing him and accusing him for trying to arrange a hotel room with her. And you know, at first I believed Doug. I believe that maybe this girl is lying about him. This girl is trying to destroy him. Because I don't know this girl, but I know Doug. And Doug seems like a pretty harmless guy. He's, he, he really loves the Lord. He loves the Word of God. He loves the brethren. You know, this girl's probably just trying to destroy him. He's probably, because he's an idiot, he's probably an easy target for her. So then the scandal then takes to Facebook. And on Facebook, everyone's defending Doug Trowbridge. And... Even though I wasn't really active on Facebook defending him, I was I was like talking to him and, and taking a side. I believed him like everyone else. And but people on Facebook started to like put this girl that is making his accusation against Doug on blast. They're they're even making YouTube videos and they're going to like her Facebook page and taking uh, showing her like personal information and her photos and and one of her photos was was with family one of her family members was like a sodomite 
So they're saying, oh, this is a conspiracy. She's a sodomite sympathizer, so she's trying to frame Doug. You know, ridiculous. I went to the girl's Facebook page when I saw that video, and it was clear to me that the girl, though worldly, nothing really bad, but just worldly, was just newly saved and just kind of like was reaching out through social media to, you know, learn more about Pastor Anderson. Well, this girl gets on Facebook and is like disturbed and distraught that all these guys are like stalking her and putting her on blast and posting her her personal information on the internet on YouTube. It was, and that's where it got really disturbing for me. I started backing off. This is really getting creepy. Why are people doing this? And uh, it's one thing to kind of like me take Doug's side, but man, you're you're really going over the top when you're posting this girl's information and just automatically assuming that she's conspiring against him because she has a family member who's a sodomite. But then it gets even weirder. Pastor Anderson has to go on Facebook and defend himself because people are now starting to put Pastor Anderson on blast, criticizing him for how he handled it. And I guess I guess what happened was when this girl sent us this the evidence of this conversation with Doug to Pastor Anderson. Pastor Anderson, I don't know if you called or text Doug, but said that you're not something like you're not right with God and you're not welcome out of my church. Don't come. And that he left it at that. He didn't make a, like a video exposing Doug or a post necessarily or anything like that. And so he's being put on blast. And people are criticizing Pastor Anderson how he handled it. You know, and first of all, like he's the pastor of his church. He has every right to protect his flock that he's how he sees fit. If he thinks that there's even a remote chance this guy's a weirdo that could compromise people in the church, he shouldn't let him in. And Pastor Anderson wasn't calling him a reprobate or a psychopath or or anything like that. Just said you're not. He said you're not right with God. You know, that's you can be saved and not right with God. <clears throat> and so, he, you know, I thought Pastor Anderson handled it great, but then people were putting him on blast, and and he uh, so he got on there and defended himself and said this is ridiculous that people were criticizing me something like that he even said I have all the evidence you know and I took Pastor Anderson's side I believe him I mean I believe his judgment too but, we'll just, but just remember this it'll come, about, come up later just think about all the people putting this girl on blast and then putting Pastor Anderson on blast but no one's putting no one's questioning Doug I mean you're criticizing Pastor Anderson and this girl and really, it was disturbing. And this is when I started to back off and started to like back off defending Doug. But I still wanted to believe him. I still wanted to think that he was just this humble idiot that had no good social skills. So he was very, when Pastor Anderson got on Facebook and, and, and basically defended himself, you know, <clears throat> Doug was very upset about it. He was calling me and my friends and he was just like irate. And I was kind of like, well, I wanted to like encourage him. Maybe he messed up, maybe. And I started, I, I, and to be honest, I, I believed. I went from switching. I believed Pastor Anderson. I ended up believing this girl. I think Doug was, Doug, in, in hindsight, it's for sure, Doug really did try to commit fornication with this girl. He tried to do this. And think about this. This is disturbing. Yeah, of course a Christian could backslide into that. But this, the disturbing part is the whole time he's talking about how he's winning all these people to the Lord, how great, you know, what, what kinds of Christian stuff, how, how, talking about how spiritual he is, and all this, while at the same time, he's trying to hook up with a girl while trying to go to, while trying to creep into Faithful Word Baptist. That's pretty disturbing. And so, but I thought, you know, okay, he's just immature, maybe he comes across wrong to girls, he doesn't know how to talk to girls, so I, maybe I'll, I'll try this to, you know, encourage him and say, hey, sorry you got, you know, exposed. <laughs> Maybe let me try helping you. But he was just, I raised calm me, all my friends and I. So when I'm on the phone with him, trying to like get him calmed down, trying to get him uh, repentant, trying to, you know, get him right with God, he was just irate. And this, he was doing this with all my friends, just talking about how wicked Pastor Anderson is. He's evil, he's wicked. And it's like, there's no repentance in him. And when I saw that there was no repentance, no remorse about Pastor Anderson exposing him, or exposing a situation for what it was, I should say, I was like, well, look, you're not even right with God. I don't want to have fellowship with you if you're not even humble enough. If he was humble, my friends I even talked about, if he has a humble heart about this whole situation, we'll try to help him and encourage him and coach him, you know, bring him along. But he was just, just irate, like just blasting Pastor Anderson. And I didn't want nothing to do with it. So I told him, I told him straight up, I want nothing to do with this. And he, oh yeah, then he started getting mad at me and my friends for not defending him on Facebook, for not taking a side. And we're just the whole time trying to reason with him. But he was trying to 
he's coming down on us, making us the bad guys, and we're bad guys because we're not defending him. We're not going on social media defending him. So that's when he was like trying to turn my friends and I against each other somehow, I remember. So we just defriended him on Facebook. It was creepy because I, when I defriended him on Facebook or deleted him as a friend, I, I kid you not, within a minute, within a minute, he calls me <clears throat> and says, I saw you, oh Jeff, I saw that you deleted me on Facebook. And that's when I ripped into him and said, I want nothing to do with you. You're not right. You're not right with God. Pastor Anderson's right. You, I don't want nothing to do with you. So like, you know, I hung up on the, hung up with him. Well, so, you know, a bunch of us deleted him off Facebook and he was obviously upset. So after my friends and I already excommunicated Doug, weeks go by and the dust settles and everyone moved on from the Doug Trowbridge scandal where he tried to like seduce this girl into getting a hotel room with him. I'm sitting in my office and I get a phone call from a number that I do not recognize. And when I answer it, the person on the other line had a Middle Eastern accent and his, he claimed to be a, a, a former Muslim by the name of Hamid. His story was, is that when I was in New York City, I got him saved and then after I got him saved, I gave him my phone number and told him, hey, if you need anything, give me a call, which is why he's calling me. Now, this is interesting because anyone who's been soldering with me knows that this is something that I occasionally do. If I get someone saved and I want and I want to be a blessing to them, I'll give them my phone number and tell them if you need anything, give me a call. So this was not out of the ordinary. But what was not inconsistent, what was inconsistent, and what didn't make sense to me is I don't remember ever getting a Muslim saved. But I figured, so I knew I knew that this guy had to been some kind of stalker. There was something creepy about it. So I figure I'll just keep talking to him, get information from him. I figure the best place to keep a stalker is in front of me. So I'm talking to him, trying to get a story. So he said, you know, his name was Hamid. He came from a Muslim family. He got saved in New York. And he and his fiance were receiving death threats from his family for converting to Christianity. And I'm talking to him and I started noticing that the guy was very familiar with with our the new IFB movement, with Pastor Anderson and, and, and our doctrines, because I was asking him about like, hey, have you listened to any sermons? I give you any sermons? He's like, yeah, you give, you gave me some, you gave me a website or a YouTube channel by the guy, guy by a guy named Pastor Anderson. I've been listening to them, so the guy's very familiar with this stuff, and I, I, I thought maybe Trowbridge would be behind it, but the guy did not sound like Trowbridge at all, and I mean, he had a Middle Eastern accent, but um, it, the guy. The guy was very seemed to be very intelligent, and so you know I'm talking to him, and then you know I'm telling him, you know he's like concerned, he's like scared for his fiance, he doesn't know what to do. He's I don't know if he's trying to get money out of me or wants me to wire him money, but I basically told him, hey, I mean, you know the best thing to do is just to skip town. I mean that's the best advice I can give you right now, if you're in that kind of danger. And then when I said that, he's you know he says, hold on, there's someone at the door, and you're like hearing a knocking on the door on his end of the line. And he goes to answer the door, and then when he answers it, you hear a crash, and the line goes blank. Now, a few minutes after it hangs up, I get a voicemail, and, and it didn't even ring. It went straight to voicemail, and the voicemail was the same guy, Hamid, who's now sounding like he's like dying, like he's been shot in the chest, he's choking on his own blood, and he's having a difficult time breathing, and he's asking me for help, asking me to call, you know, he's giving me his address and asking me to, to call 911 for him, to send him help because they shot his fiance. Now, some things that are inconsistent about this is number one, remember, I don't remember getting a Muslim slave, and number two, if you're really dying, why are you calling me? Why aren't you calling your local 911 dispatcher? What, what can I do for you in Ohio? So I immediately thought it was strange. So I went on, I, I sent out a private message, a group, a group chat, through Facebook to anyone, to a group of people who are familiar with Doug, who are associated with Doug, who were at the New York City Sony Marathon, asking if they got any strange phone calls. Many of them, most of them reported back saying, yeah, I got a, a phone call from a number I don't recognize, I didn't answer it though. One person said, yeah, I got a call from someone who said he's from the Kill All Fags Association, he's gonna go kill all fags. So when I heard that, I immediately thought, okay, this has definitely gotta be the work of Trowbridge. Is that something that he would post on Facebook, really over the top? blowhard stuff and so I tried calling Doug that night I tried texting him and calling him no answer so the next morning around 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon probably when Doug wakes up I get a call back from him and it's a typical Doug persona where he's like over the top humble and he's like hey brother Jeff I saw that you called last night what's going on and I was like and I thought it was odd that he's being that humble and that that 
that that nice to me because remember weeks earlier I've already excommunicated from him and we had this huge falling out so I thought it was odd that he's calling me and acting this humble calling me brother but I confronted him I said did you call me last night because I got a prank call and I was pretty sure it was you and he's like no brother Jeff I don't know what you're talking about and I was like you sure it wasn't you and then this is where it gets really creepy with Doug because I'm gonna quote you exactly what he said next and I did not ask him to do this. I didn't ask him to promise me, but this is what he said. He goes, Brother Jeff, I promise you, I swear to God, I did not call you. And at that point, I was kind of like, wow, either, okay, you're really serious, you didn't call me, or you're gonna really take this lie to the next level where you're gonna make a promise and an oath like this. So as far as I'm concerned, the conversation was done. So I hung up the phone with him and moved on. Well, I didn't really move on because I was still convinced it was him. But I was able to corner him on Facebook when I threatened to call a phone carrier to track down to see whose number it was that called me. And that's when Doug was forced to fess up. But what's very disturbing is his response to this on Facebook when he was called out. So now after I cornered Doug by threatening to call the phone carrier, Doug makes his appearance and admits that the prank call came from him and his so-called friend John. However, there is not the slightest sign of repentance in Doug. And keep in mind, we had already excommunicated Doug weeks before. So this prank call was not in jest, but rather it was an attempt by Doug to seek revenge on those who had excommunicated him weeks earlier. And as you see, I called Doug a reprobate, and I meant it. Just two hours earlier on the phone, Doug was acting all humble, promising that he did not call me. But now he's acting like a prideful bully, and not realizing the extent to how serious breaking a vow is and my reprobate accusation is only confirmed in the comments that follow. Also notice his attitude toward Pastor Anderson and refusing to accept rebuke, not only for the prank call, but also for not admitting wrong or guilt in trying to seduce a girl into getting a hotel room with him. Now it's important to point out that Doug's so-called friend John does not have a Facebook account, and no one has ever met him, nor will he ever make an appearance in this discussion. And as you'll see in the comment, I suspect that this is Doug's alter ego. The same night I received Doug's prank call, Pastor Anderson also received a call from Doug pretending to be someone from Homeland Security demanding him to take his sermons down from the internet. Now sometime after this blow up on Facebook where I called Doug a psychopath reprobate, I uploaded a video of the voicemail. In this recording, you can hear what initially appears to be an intelligent person doing an incredible acting job playing the part of a dying Arab but is in fact Doug himself. The discussion that takes place in the comments section of this video is also very revealing. In this discussion, we are introduced to a woman named Nina Williamson, who I've never met, nor am I friends with her on Facebook at this time. But she is familiar with Doug's voice, as she and her husband Jason also had long conversations with Doug over the phone in the past. And she is convinced that this is in fact the voice of Doug Trowbridge, when at the time I was not convinced. I then agreed with Nina that this could be the voice of Doug, based on his personality change that I experienced earlier with him. Notice in this comment Doug's inconsistent personality, where just minutes before he's criticizing me for being more worried about his prank phone call rather than the multitudes of lost souls going to hell, and then the next minute he's challenging me to square up with him in a fight. Now notice that in this comment he refers to us as you Pastor Anderson followers, 
meaning that he himself is not a follower of Pastor Anderson. This is significant because just a week before, he's on social media talking about how he got saved through Pastor Anderson's ministry and that he's Pastor Anderson's biggest admirer. And so this comment reveals that his admiration for Pastor Anderson was actually a lie. And remember that strange behavior I mentioned earlier where Doug's Facebook friends went so far in their defense of Doug over this girl's testimony that they even started attacking Pastor Anderson's character? It begins to make sense now when you realize that Doug's superficial charm and flattery towards those he spent hours on the phone with in the months leading up to this was just a con in order to later manipulate them into thinking that this scandal is everybody and anybody's fault but Doug's. Besides more evidence of Doug's lying, manipulation, and pride when he challenges me to a fight all the while trying to act spiritual, the most important piece of information to take away from this discussion is that after Nina points out that the voicemail sounded like the voice of Doug Trowbridge, he never corrects Nina by telling her that this was his friend John. This information further confirms my suspicions that Doug has an alter ego named John. Not only was Doug's prank call to me a childish act for a 22-year-old grown man, it's also illegal. By inducing panic, Doug is causing serious public inconvenience and alarm, with no regard for public safety, making this particular phone call an early sign of Doug's antisocial personality disorder. Why in that camera for? Chances are you've seen him. Try to dig to the restaurant. Sympathized with his wheelchair, yeah, his drawn hands, you. his story Why ripped at your heart. They give me money and to dig some eat. And if so, you're not alone. I was a millionaire one time, Sue Honda of America, $2.4 million. All that money gone now. That actually so, is the truth. We did some research and sure enough, Thompson's mother was the plaintiff in a 1993 lawsuit against Honda for a motorcycle accident. The wreck left him with limited mobility, but it certainly didn't make him mentally handicapped and we knew better. You were just talking to me fine a second ago. When? Lexington police say he's taken his act on tour of the city to places like the Lansdowne Shops, Hamburg, and the Zandale Corridor of Nicholasville Road. We busted this bogus beggar right outside the police department just minutes after a press conference about him. I appreciate you guys busting me. <laughs> yeah, I'm really good at it, really good. I clear about $100,000 a year doing this. $100,000? Yeah, about 60 to 100. The 30 year old said he's from Austin, Texas, and has done the same thing there. He also says he's got a degree in speech language pathology. He's combined that training with his wheelchair and found that panhandling pays. You ready to move to another city and start this? No, no, I'm not. I'm just beginning. And just like that, my, my beat, beat, beat boy, I'm just playing. I got to go, y'all. I got to make some money. He was back at it again. Covering the news in Lexington, Kristen Flum, LEX 18 News. Now I really need to emphasize this point because the prank call was not what bothered me that night. What bothered me was the idea and thought that the person I could be talking to on the phone was Doug Trowbridge because the person that I was talking to was far more intelligent than the Doug Trowbridge that I thought I knew. I want to note that at no time did I suspect Doug of having disassociative identity disorder or multiple personalities nor did I suspect demon possession, but rather we are seeing the real personality behind the mask of the humble, stuttering idiot that we know as Doug Trowbridge. But now in 2018, it has been revealed that Doug's real name is Doug John Trowbridge Thone, and he even has an alternate Facebook account where he goes by the name Doug John Trowbridge. About a day after the blow up on Facebook, Doug makes a post to the group playing the victim card, claiming his own goodness and claiming that I'm somehow persecuting him and that my actions are hindering the cause of Christ. All the while, he is still guilty and unrepentant about trying to seduce a woman into getting a hotel room with him and then falsely accusing her of conspiring against him, bringing her unwarranted slander. Now I want you to see how a known psychopath reprobate reacts under these circumstances where they deny their actions as being harmful to the victims and play the victim card for themselves. Between 2002 and 2004, 
Ariel Castro kidnapped three young girls and held them captive in his home in the Tremont neighborhood of Cleveland, Ohio. While imprisoned in his basement, Castro repeatedly raped his victims and induced miscarriages through beatings if they were to get pregnant. This torture continued until their escape nine years later, on May 6, 2013. And thank you, Alex. And the judge, as you know, said that Michelle Knight showed remarkable restraint when she listened to Ariel Castro's long ramble about his own unhappiness. We asked Nightline anchor Cynthia McFadden to ask the experts to take us inside the mind of a deluded abuser. Ariel Castro took full advantage of his right to speak today. For 16 minutes, he alternated between self-pity and apology, defiance and lack of remorse. Through it all, stunning delusion. Most of the sex that went on in the house, and probably all of it, was consensual. In a bizarre, rambling 16-minute statement, Castro implied he was the real victim, insisting that he never abused any of the women. I am not Perhaps Mr. Castro cannot bear to see himself the way the rest of us do, saying repeatedly he is not violent, not a monster. He called himself a victim, saying as a child he'd been sexually assaulted and is now addicted to porn. The judge made short order of that. You've been a victimizer. But surely Mr. Castro is right about one thing. He is a sick man. A few months after the blow-up on Facebook, a terrible tragedy takes place when Nina Williamson's husband, Jason, and father of her three-month-old child, dies in a motorcycle accident. But rather than having empathy for a grieving widow, Doug immediately goes to Facebook and ruthlessly declares that her husband deserved to die for his mistreatment of Doug. And what was this perceived mistreatment? Well, after Doug was exposed trying to seduce a girl into getting a hotel room with him, Jason appropriately blocked Doug on Facebook. Everyone is so frightened by his post that whatever friends Doug had left in the new IFB movement defriended him. And at this point, Doug goes off the radar for the next two years. Then around March of 2016, Doug would reappear in the new IFB movement, attending People's Baptist Church in New Jersey and attending sewing marathons. This appears odd to those who are familiar with Doug's history in that he has no signs of remorse or shame of his previous behavior. In fact, when people looked at his Facebook wall, he still had the post about Nina's husband up from two years earlier. When confronted about this publicly, Doug issues an apology on Facebook. Keep in mind, this is not the only transgression of Doug. Remember, this whole thing started back in 2014 when Doug was exposed trying to seduce a girl into getting a hotel room with him, which he still hasn't apologized to this day, bringing this woman unwarranted slander and grief. And so when Doug came back into the movement in 2016, it became apparent that I was inevitably going to run into him again. Then on December 12th, 2016, I would travel to New York with some friends to listen to Pastor Anderson preach in person. While on this trip, I would take the opportunity to go soul winning with Doug. While out soul winning, I saw Doug give a very thorough gospel presentation to a Muslim who he then led in prayer. Now if anyone thinks that just because Doug preaches the same gospel as us guarantees his salvation, just remember, Judas Iscariot who walked with Jesus for three years also preached the same gospel. And his motive for creeping in was not to bring in false doctrine, but simply to exploit the financial resources of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, on this point, I want to reference you to Dr. Robert Hare's book, Without Conscience, The Disturbing World of the Psychopaths Among Us, where he states on page 50, quote, It's not unusual, for example, for a particular adept manipulator to declare himself born again in the Christian sense, not only to convince the parole board of his sincere resolve to reform, but to exploit the elaborate and well-meaning born-again community for its support, not to mention its material resources, end quote. Then in July of 2018, a video has surfaced of Doug Trowbridge running around the aisles of a Baptist Castle church service. This behavior of Doug running around like a Pentecostal is very inconsistent for someone who claims to be part of the new IFB movement. Because of this obvious inconsistency, Doug has been telling his friends that this event occurred six years ago in 2012. However, if you look at the video, it only took place two and a half years ago at a youth conference in Tennessee. Now why is this significant? Here I made a timeline of events in Doug Trowbridge's life between 2012 and 2018. In September of 2013, my friends and I went to New York for the Soul Winning Marathon, where we first met Doug. 
At this marathon, Doug informed me that he got saved by listening to the sermon titled Doubts About Your Salvation, preached by Pastor Anderson in July of 2012. So Doug's original salvation testimony had to have taken place between July of 2012 and September of 2013. Now, one of my friends who was Doug's soul winning partner in New York noted that Doug did preach the gospel, the same gospel that we preach, and led the person in prayer. So at this point in Doug's life, he's very familiar with the gospel. But then on April 2014 is when I received a prank call from Doug Trowbridge. Then the subsequent event of Doug Trowbridge posting about Nina Williamson's husband. Then Doug goes off the radar. Then on February 2016, Doug is seen running down the aisle at a Baptist Coastal Church. But then three weeks later, Doug reappears in the new IFB movement. But what's interesting about Doug's reappearance is that he is now giving a new testimony of salvation, stating that he got saved by Pastor Anderson on January 1st, 2014. This new testimony of salvation by Doug means that he got saved a few months after the New York City Soldering Marathon, but just before the prank phone calls. Now why is Doug's salvation testimony so inconsistent while the whole time he's preaching the same gospel? I'll tell you why because he doesn't actually believe what he's preaching. Doug is an unsaved pathological liar masquerading as a Christian, and he's losing track of his lies and forgetting to make them consistent. Now the reason for Doug running around the aisles of a Baptist Coastal Church service is because Doug is a chameleon, and he will conform to any set of doctrines, beliefs, or practices in order to earn the trust of the church's congregates, so that he can later exploit them for their financial resources, or worse, his sexual conquests. One thing that stood out to me after Doug re-emerged back into the movement was his obsession of documenting the converts of his with a photo at the door. This immediately reminds me of a specific statement made by Doug four years earlier. As mentioned earlier, when I first became friends with Doug on Facebook, he would often write posts claiming to have gotten multitudes saved in sub-zero temperatures while out souling in New York City. And in this comment, Doug is responding to someone calling him out as a liar for making those claims. Doug's response reveals that his current obsession of taking pictures with his so-called converts is a calculated adjustment to prevent future suspicions about his true nature. Now let's take the behavioral habits that we have observed of Doug over the course of five years and apply them to a clinically used psychological test that predicts psychopathic behavior. The Psychopathy Checklist Revised, or PCLR, developed by Robert Hare, is a psychological assessment tool used to measure the presence of psychopathy. It is a 20-item inventory of perceived personality traits and recorded behaviors of the individuals tested. These 20 personality traits are rated 0 to 2. Zero meaning does not apply, one applies somewhat, and two applies fully. This psychological checklist is virtually the same checklist that is given in Romans chapter 1, where God gives the personality traits of those individuals who have rejected God and have been given over to a reprobate mind. The PCLR places humans on a spectrum of normal behavior, antisocial personality behavior, or ASPD, and then psychopathic behavior. A normal human being will score between 0 and 5, and an individual with ASPD could expect to place between 20 and 22, and a clinically diagnosed psychopath will place between 30 and 40. So to put this into perspective, one of history's most ruthless and evasive serial killers, Ted Bundy, scored a 39 out of 40, placing him very high on the PCLR spectrum. However, Jeffrey Dahmer, another famous serial killer, scored a 22 placing him in the middle of the spectrum, but still very violent and dangerous. Because I lacked the long-term observation needed in order to score an individual with a 2 on the items of the PCLR, I could only score Doug with a 1 based on his behavior from 4 years ago, giving him a total score of 13. However, this second time around, we find that Doug is repeating the exact same behaviors from 4 years ago. In this video, where Pastor Romero documents Doug's behaviors over the course of his time at Steadfast, you will hear him document the same behaviors that I experienced in Doug four years earlier. These behaviors are also items to be scored on the PCLR, which include glib and superficial charm, grandiose self-worth, pathological lying, conning and manipulative, 
lack of remorse or guilt, shallow effect, callousness and lack of empathy, parasitic lifestyle, poor behavioral controls, impulsivity, irresponsibility, and failure to accept responsibility for his own actions. Now there's two items on the PCLR that Pastor Romero did not point out in his video that anyone who knows Doug can agree that these apply fully to Doug's psychological makeup, which are Seek stimulation or prone to boredom. Anyone who knows Doug knows that this is a very consistent behavioral trait of Doug. He is a high octane individual, yet he's very lazy when it comes to actual work. Doug constantly needs stimulation, whether it would be gorging on food, recreational activities, or chatting on the phone for 10 hours a day. He's very needy and will exhaust both your energy and finances. Lack of realistic long-term goals. Again, anyone who knows Doug knows that he lacks the capacity to apply himself toward achieving any long-term goal or career, leaving him bouncing from one job to another. This information is very significant because the first time I scored Doug three years ago, I lacked a long-term observation required by the PCLR to give Doug a factor of two However, even when I rated Doug with a 1 on the checklist where I clearly saw these behavioral traits in him, he still scored a 13, well outside the range of a normal person, but not psychopathic. So when Doug re-emerges in the movement in 2016 and repeats the same antisocial behaviors documented by Pastor Romero, we now have a sufficient history of Doug's long-term behavioral patterns and can re-evaluate him on the PCLR, now scoring him with a 2 because now we can conclude that these traits fully apply to Doug's psychological makeup. Upon re-evaluation, Doug's new PCLR score is now 29. And as disturbing as that is, what's even more disturbing is that this is an incomplete score of Doug's psychopathy. Because I do not have access to Doug's medical and school records and possibly a juvenile record, I am not able to score him in five of the categories in the PCLR. So with this evaluation being incomplete, we have to consider the possibility that if we had access to these records, it's very conceivable that we can see up to an additional 10 points added to Doug's score, making him an extremely dangerous individual that should not be trusted under any circumstances. My concerns for who Doug Trowbridge really was started with a disturbing phone call from him over four years ago. And remember, I was not the only one who got a call that night. Again, there was an attempt by Doug posing as someone from Homeland Security, attempting to intimidate and threaten Pastor Stephen L. Anderson to take down his sermons from the internet. So to understand the significance of these prank calls, let's examine a case where a known psychopath used a similar tactic to intimidate his victims. The Golden State Killer is a serial killer, rapist, and burglar who committed at least 12 murders, more than 50 rapes, and over 100 burglaries throughout California between 1974 and 1975, he was known as the Vesalia Ransacker, breaking into suburban homes and ransacking them while the homeowner slept in bed. But then like all psychopaths who seek stimulation, this psychopath's crimes predictably became more violent and between 1976 and 1979, he would become known as the Easteria Rapist, where he broke into homes, binding his victims, and then raping one of the women. Then once the rape was finished, he would then ransack his victim's fridge for food and beer before exiting the home. Then between 1979 and 1986, he would become known as the original Night Stalker, where he began murdering the residents of the homes he broke into. These three crime sprees were originally thought to be the work of three different men, spawning three different nicknames in the press. But then in 2001, using DNA technology, it was discovered that these three crime sprees were the work of one man, giving him the new nickname, the Golden State Killer. Then on April 24, 2018, 72-year-old Joseph James D'Angelo was eventually identified as the Golden State Killer using advanced DNA technology and was apprehended by authorities at his home in Citrus Heights, California, leaving both family and neighbors in shock as they had no idea that a psychopath serial killer lived in their midst for over 30 years. This serial killer evaded police for over 44 years, all the while hiding in plain sight working as a police officer and later as a mechanic, near to where his crimes took place. Once this psychopath targeted a victim, he would make a series of prank calls to them leading up to his attack. But even years after the rape took place, he would continue to taunt his victims with disturbing and threatening phone calls. Hello? Hello?
Now, many people who know Doug often report an uncomfortable feeling they get from him when they're around him. And the reason for this is because Doug often displays odd behaviors that are confusing to them. But once you come to grips with the fact and recognize that Doug Trowbridge is a psychopath reprobate, then all the pieces fit together and everything makes sense. Take, for instance, this odd behavior reported by Pastor Romero. And then I said, what are you sorry for? Name me something that you did wrong. Because if you're sorry, that means you did something wrong. And he's like, he said the same thing he said 20 minutes before. Well, I'm sorry how I handled the situation. I said, but what did you do? I said, name me three sins that you did. Name me a sin that you did. I've just, for 18 minutes, explained to him what he did wrong. And why he's not allowed at church. And he's like, well, I can't remember what you said. I'm like, you can't remember what I said. Now to understand Doug's inability to acknowledge where he sinned, we have to understand the origins of the human conscience from the Bible. In Romans chapter 2, in verses 14 and 15, the Bible reads, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So according to the Bible, the human conscience is a God-given tool that not only teaches us right from wrong, but it also serves to tell us when we are right or wrong. In other words, our conscience is a witness to our actions to either convict us when we are wrong, as in the case of the men in John chapter 8 verse 9, or it clears us when we are right, as in the case of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 9 verse 1. However, the Bible explains in the book of Romans chapter 1 that a person can go so far in their rejection of God that even God himself will give him over to a reprobate mind whose conscience will then cease to exist and whose psychologists diagnose as psychopaths. So when Doug tried to apologize to Pastor Romero, Pastor Romero asked Doug for specifics, reasons why he's sorry, what did he do wrong? Doug was not able to give him any reasons. Doug, Doug was not able to explain why he's sorry because that God-given conscience, that witness that should be in Doug to tell him what he did wrong was not there because Doug is a psychopath reprobate whose conscience has been seared with a hot iron. So based on these findings, I am certain that the person that I talked to on the phone four years ago was the real personality behind the mask of Doug Trowbridge. And again, I will refer to him as John Thone. So after everything that I observed from Doug for the past four years, I have to conclude that he's unsaved and he's beyond the hope of salvation because he's what the Bible calls a reprobate. And clinically speaking, he can't even respond to therapy or intervention because he's what the psychologists call a psychopath. And therefore, he must be marked and avoided and deemed very dangerous. And these past four years have been a cat and mouse game for Doug. And he keeps pushing the limits of how much he can play us. And the longer he's allowed to play this game, the more emboldened he'll become and will only wax worse and worse. But I decided that I would not let Doug go off the radar the second time around, only to remask and later reemerge. I began to think of ways I could get him to drop his mask publicly and thus exposing himself. Then I noticed something in Pastor Romero's video that was very revealing to me about Doug's psychopathy. And that is when you address the psychopath behind the mask, Doug will avoid responding altogether. I believe this is because he doesn't know how to respond properly without taking off the mask. So rather than risk exposing himself, he plays it safe by not responding at all. And I said, you know what? I said, basically, I said, Doug, I said, I think you're an infiltrator. I think you're a wolf. And I don't think you're coming in to spread false doctrine. I think you come in here to mooch and to leech on people. I said, I told him straight up. I said, I think you're an infiltrator. Now, a normal person, if they're told that they're accused of being an infiltrator to their face, they're gonna say, look, I may have done something wrong, but I'm not an infiltrator. He didn't even address that. It was so, it was, the whole conversation was very strange. You could tell it was very, very insincere. So upon this observation, I decided to adopt the same technique and speak directly to the psychopath behind the mask and hopefully provoke a response. And on July 21st, 2018, 
I would begin to leave a series of comments warning people of Doug being a psychopath who could grow into a child molesting serial killer. Next, I leave a post on his Facebook wall calling him out as a psychopath reprobate. However, as I anticipated, Doug then deletes my post from his wall and blocks me from his Facebook page. So then I leave a public post that everyone can see and that he cannot remove. Now Doug is trapped and forced to take the bait and address my statements publicly. And knowing that the psychopath doesn't have a conscience, I expect a response that will reflect his reprobate mind. And right on cue, Doug responds to my statements publicly. And for the first time in four years, I hear from him. John Thone, the psychopath behind the mask of Doug Trowbridge. Remember, at no time leading up to this did I ever accuse Doug of actually being guilty of child molestation or murder. Yet Doug perceives that there is an allegation of child molestation by me. And rather than outright denying such perversion, Doug takes issue that a person could make such an allegation without any tangible proof. And for the record, I don't have any such proof. But it doesn't matter, because Doug's own statements reveal the disturbing possibility that in his mind, there is a chance that such proof could exist. Lastly, I have a message for Doug Trowbridge, or should I refer to you as John Thone. It's game over. <laughs>